Good afternoon, and um, it's great to, to know you're there if we can't see you. For those who don't know me, I'm Tess McCormick. I'm Head of Development um, at Mansfield, although not sadly at college at the moment as we're all working remotely. Um, this is the last in our series of alumni talks this term, and we are absolutely delighted to have as our speaker this evening, um, Professor Helen Margetts. And I've just seen that our principal has joined us as well, um, Helen Mountfield. Helen, are you, are you able to speak or have you? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hello. Nice to have um, our principal here um, this evening too. So I'm just going to say a few words and do a bit of housekeeping and then I'll pass over um, to Helen Margetts to start um, tonight's talk. The title is Government, Artificial Intelligence and COVID-19. Can AI help us to make better public policy in a crisis? And um, Helen is Professor of Society and the Internet um, here at Oxford University and a professor professorial fellow um, at Mansfield as well. Um, for those of you who, who haven't heard Helen before, um, she's a political scientist specialising in the relationship between digital technology and government, politics and public policy. And since 2018, Helen's been director of the public policy programme at the Alan Turing Institute, which you'll know is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and for Artificial Intelligence. Um, Helen gave a talk uh, back in uh, when we were still at college uh, back in March at Mansfield as, as part of our Friday talk series called Magical Reality, Using Artificial Intelligence for the Public Good. And it was just absolutely brilliant and blew me away. So we really were so pleased to have her this evening and really wanted to include Helen in our, in our series for alumni um, of virtual events this term. Um, just before I hand over to Helen, so it would be great, I think you all have, if you could turn your mics off and your videos off um, until we have a question and answer bit at the end of the session. Um, we are recording this session as well, just so we can share it with other members of the alumni community um, after the event who couldn't join us now. Um, and we'll make sure we get that out and, and up on our um, YouTube channel with the other events we've had. Uh, this term as well. We've had a fantastic lineup. Um, right, that's probably enough from me. I'm going to turn off now and, and hand over to Helen. Helen. Helen, thank you so much for joining us and um, uh, can't wait to, to hear from you tonight. Thank you very much um, and uh, welcome everybody and thank you for coming uh, in these weird times. And because I gave that lecture at Mansfield, which is shortly going to be online, and also I've recently given a talk at the Oxford Internet Institute, um, which is uh, also already online, so somebody can uh, post that in the chat. I'm not going to use any slides. I'm going to talk. Uh, I hope that's okay. Um, but if you're if you're if you're dying for another PowerPoint today, um, you can easily get the the PowerPoint similar PowerPoint to the one I would have had um, speaking with a colleague yesterday. Um, uh, so I hope that way we'll have a bit of time for discussion and questions um, at the end. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, the current crisis and how the latest generation of data intensive technology might help kind of get us out, out of here, as it were. Um, and But first of all, for anyone who isn't at all familiar with it, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to the kind of work we're doing at the Alan Turing Institute because it directly feeds into thinking here. Um, and in an ideal world, I would have with me um, two of my kind of co-conspirators, um, Cosmina Dorabanti, who's the Deputy Director of the Public Policy Programme, which I direct, and also Ben MacArthur, who talked with me yesterday, um, and he's the deputy director of the Turing Health Programme. Um, so this is kind of, uh, this is joint thinking we're doing at the moment to kind of build a better, um, better policy making uh, systems for the future because we do feel that, that the UK government in particular is not managing very well with this crisis and we want to, ho we, we hope for a better time with future crises. Um, so, first of all, the Turing Institute is the National Institute for Data Science and AI, as Tess said, 
Um, it, I'll come back to that, but it's actually the National Institute for Data Science. And then there was a report a couple of years ago, um, the Hall and Presenti report um, uh, by two computer scientists, which said we should also be the National Institute for AI. And we're not stupid. So AI was added. But as I talked about in the lecture I gave at Mansfield before, just before the lockdown, last thing I really did, actually, um, it, there's a lot of hype about AI. And for reasons I'll explain, I'd like to move away uh, from the hype a bit in, this, in the conversation we have here, um, because I, I don't think it, it's, it's terribly helpful. Uh, so I mentioned the health program, and I'll, I'll just focus on that for one second. That's directed by Chris Holmes, who's a statistician, a professor of medical statistics here at Oxford as well. So the Oxford is well, um, is very much embedded in the leadership of the Turing. Um, and that program is basically about using data science and AI to improve healthcare and improve um, epidemiological research and health, health research in particular, healthcare research. What interventions um, work and how can they be better and how can resources be more um, targeted uh, to uh, minimising risk for people. And um, it's, it's worth mentioning because there's a big pro that that's embarked on a big project of the Turing called DCOVID. Uh, do have a look at the Turing website if you're interested. And that is about using real time data analytics generated by hospitals that are more digitally mature um, to try and kind of optimize outcomes for patients in the pandemic. This is a very new disease. Clinicians don't have any past experience to go on. Um, even now after a, uh, after a good few weeks of it and that's about kind of being able to uh, target care and to uh, maximize um, the number of lives saved and, and to somehow um, decide how to do that. Um, and then the public policy program which I direct is also about making life better with, uh, uh, with, with, with data science and AI um it was set up in may 2018 we've got lots of projects and i'm not going to talk about all of them of course um but basically uh, we've got sort of two sets of objectives um which we derived from talking to people all over government about what data science and ai might do for government and one set are more technical they're about how can we use ai technologies data science technologies to make better policy, deliver better services, improve government, um, government processes. And then the other set are about the ethics of that, because there will be some among you most likely who already, even when I was talking about de-COVID, were bristling there, hang on, what, allocating resources on the basis of some sort of technology? That's not right. And of course, that's not quite what I was talking about. I was talking about a de decision support system. But even so, there are always ethical questions about this sort of technology. Um, and we found, much to our surprise, in fact, that a lot of the kind of interest and concern in equal measure were about the ethics and kind of making an ethical framework for this kind of use of technology, because the ethical issues in using technology for public goods are different from those that arise when you're talking about private goods. There's some overlap, of course, because these are generic technologies that have all sorts of functions. Um, and we're proud of the fact, for example, that um, my team produced the uh, first sort of official comprehensive guide for the ethics of the use of AI in the public sector, which combines kind of values and principles. It's based on the ideas of fairness, accountability, sustainability and transparency and takes those values right the way through from abstract principles to actual tangible advice on what policymakers should do in given situations when they're thinking about building models to do this kind of thing. Um, and, and we're working with about 75 public sector organisations um, and that's very exciting to me. I've been working for a long time on this question of the relationship between technology and government and there used not to be very much interest in that area even among policymakers. Information systems, computer systems were things they didn't really want to think about 
And now there's a lot of interest right from the top, from ministers to senior civil servants to people right across the policy making system. People at all levels of government are thinking about what this kind of technology could do. Now, here's my point about hype. To really think about what technology can do for government, you have to go away from the hype. You have to go away from autonomous vehicles and superhuman robots and go playing programs that can beat humans at, at a game that they play. Um, and you, you've got to go away for the moment beyond kind of superhuman intelligence where robots will become almost indistinguishable from humans. Um, what I'm talking about uh, are really quite workaday types of artificial intelligence where machines are thinking a bit more like humans in that they're, um, uh, that they're, 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 they're experiencing from the world around them, they're looking at large patterns of data, they're kind of processing large patterns of data that they're picking up in their environment and then they're um, kind of linking together patterns and making observations that are based in patterns in that data. That's a very kind of um, rough overview of what it means um, to uh, be a learning machine, for example, to be a piece of technology that kind of learns what's called machine learning. And that is a core technology of artificial intelligence. So in the course of our thinking about this, we've come, we've, we've, we've coalesced around a number of functions which um, we think can be of assistance to government um, in, in allocating public goods and in generally um, serving citizens. So one of those things is simulation. There's a, a methodology called agent computing which basically takes a lot of data about individuals, um, anonymized individuals, abstract individuals, but uses large quantities of data um, to kind of simulate policy situations to try and understand the effects of a policy before it goes into action. So a couple of examples there. Um, one of them is we have a, a project called Policy Priority Inference and that project is about um, simulating different levels of policy resources allocated to different policies and thinking about how they would help or how different levels of prioritisation would help developing countries reach their sustainable um, development goals. And there are quite a lot of other sort of uses of agent computing which do allow this task of simulation. We've got another one on simulating different levels of police resourcing. Um, what would be the effects of that without actually doing it, without making massive cuts to the police force, for example, and then realising the consequences after. Um, those are just a couple of examples, there, there, there are many others. The other um, technology is machine learning, um, I already mentioned that, and also natural language processing, taking large quantities of, uh, of, of text, of, of kind of words, um, and generating some sort of data from it, but making um, assumptions, for example, about how somebody was feeling when they wrote something or what was meant when somebody said something or, or detecting large patterns in um, bodies of, 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 of linguistic, of, of, of language data. Um, and there's two key things that machine learning and also uh, increasingly natural language processing are useful. One of them is the question of measuring what's going on in the outside world and, and, and detecting things. Um, we've got a, a, a project on, on hate speech where we're, we're trying to understand how much hate speech there is out there and trying to develop countermeasures to hate speech. Um, but there's all sorts of uses for, 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 for that kind of machine learning in the public sector. And also prediction risk-based models where you actually predict the risk of something and uh, of a child being excluded from school or a, or a uh, or, or, or children being at risk of some kind of abusive incident for example and build that into a model to offer some kind of support for decision makers that's obviously a controversial use of um of of, of machine learning there are less controversial ones but they tend to be controversial in the public sector 
in ways which they might not be in the private sector. If Amazon's trying to predict what book you're going to buy, that is less of a major issue. It has its own issues, of course, um, particularly to do with data governance. Um, but it's not the same issue as trying to predict something really, really um, sort of um, life and death situation like that. Um, so again, I come back to this ethics point. Um, the ethics of this is always important and it can never be something that's kind of just thought about at the beginning or the end or both. It's got to be right through the design of, of these technologies when they're used in, 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 in the public sector. It can never be completely um, separated. And I mentioned that the COVID project, one of the things that I'm very pleased with that project, it's in the health programme, which is a different programme for the one that we work on, but um, our ethics team are involved in the ethics of that project and they're actually delivering ethics kind of sessions or, or uh, I don't want to say tutorials if you like, to both clinicians and data scientists in the process of that project to ensure that ethics run right the way through it as the models are being developed and thought about. Um, so those are a few examples of what we're doing and in that way um, I like to think that we are actually sort of pushing towards a point where data science and AI really can work for the public good built on sort of fundamentals on, on fundamental methodologies and data and then fundamental ethical frameworks that kind of shape the way that those technologies are used. Anyway, that's what we've been doing at the Turing. And then, of course, along came COVID-19. And that's what I really want to talk about for the rest of the time. Because COVID-19 has exposed, um, I think, a real lack of resilience in UK policymaking systems. Why is that? Well, I think some of that comes from um, kind of decades of uh, a certain sort of public management reform where we've moved away. Resilience actually used to be a kind of core value of public administration, particularly after the two world wars and the big expansion of the functions of the welfare state. Um, resilience would be something that was prized, something that we sort of associated with the state as opposed to the private sector, perhaps. Um, but over the years, we've moved much more to a kind of business type model in government where the, the focus is on competition and, and uh, privatisation right through the, from the beginning of the 80s, really, right through, um, even through Labour administrations as well as Conservative administration. It was a kind of toolkit for reform that was pursued with particular um, enthusiasm in the UK setting. And really almost kind of segued into a period of, of, of dramatic austerity after, um, after the financial crash of 2008. So we've seen a very long running period of kind of cuts and minimization to the public services. Um, and that's had all kinds of effects, which are, 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 are I'm sure everyone is very familiar with. But something we don't think about so often because you only need it when there's a crisis is this question of a sort of lack of resilience, lack of robustness, lack of slack in the system. Um, uh, and I guess we noticed that in the COVID-19 crisis when it came to things like how many um, beds with ventilators can we get hold of? And it seemed that we, uh, in the normal run of things, could get hold of rather less than some other countries like Germany. Um, although we did start to build emergency capacity, of course. Then there's the question of departmentalism. Uh, British government has always been very departmentalised, um, very sort of big departments with a lot of kind of loyalty from the people within departments. That creates kind of barriers when it comes to data science. It's not surprising if you think of a sort of filing system of information um, pre-computers, then it didn't really matter about departmentalised information because there wasn't much you could sort of do with the data in a filing cabinet. Um, I've got a filing cabinet sitting behind me, it hasn't got any files in it actually, but it, I mean, if it did, um, it, 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 there wasn't be much I could do with it in the way of data. Um, and uh, therefore, there wasn't much possibility of, of kind of getting data about um, transactional systems, about administrative processing systems and using it to make policy. 
But now, of course, there is. Every single digital system generates data. Um, so there's a lot of advantages being able to use those data in sort of very agile ways that don't necessarily just rest in one department. I'll say something about that more in a minute. Um, another sort of silo effect that, that we've got in, um, in, in the British system, I think, which is true in many systems, but perhaps particularly true in the UK is um, a, a scientific specialisation. I mean, in, a, in part, this comes from sort of modernisation and, and the complexity of the modern world. So it is something that you can generalise about, but um, it has been mirrored through in public services in the UK. So any of the academics uh, uh, among you and, 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 and those studying for degrees will be um, very familiar with the idea that, you know, disciplines become ever more specialised. It becomes ever more difficult in a way, even at a time when we're being encouraged to do multidisciplinary research and we live in a very multidisciplinary world. We tend to sort of, people tend, academic researchers tend to sort of specialise um, more and more narrowly. And in a way, we seem to have lost generalists in our policy making systems. Hospitals used to have doctors who were generalists, and you see that much less now. Um, social workers, for example, um, kind of generalists, there are less, there are less of that kind of um, function um, within the policy making, within policy making systems um, now. And just one last silo effect, which um, I, I think the crisis has exposed, is the extent to which there's a division between policy and politics in, in the UK, compared particularly with other um, European countries. Politicians, high level politicians, um, legislators, spend less time thinking about policy than they do in other countries. There's much less consideration of the implementation of a policy, how feasible that is, what data, what the data implications are, what the system's implications are. Those are not things that politicians want to think about. We spend far less time on kind of legislation for policy. Um, uh, politicians in general find, spend far less time thinking about that than they do in Germany, for example. Now that may be why our, our politics is more, more exciting, perhaps, um, more dramatic. Um, it's not bound down by kind of boring considerations. Um, perhaps it's more exciting than German politics, but I think most of us would agree after the last few years that we might manage with a little bit less excitement. So those are some of the things that I think of kind of are the long running factors in um, lack of resilience. And they have all sorts of effects, but one of the effects is on um, the kind of things I think you need to get out of this crisis, i.e data and data science. Um, so take, for example, this question of departmentalism. So the traditional way, if a department is trying to think, for example, um, a, a, about some question that they might want to solve with technology, um, this is a real life situation. The Department for Business, Energy, Innovation and Skills um, was interested in developing a model for identifying the people who are at risk of ending up in fuel poverty. Um, so to do that, they sort of thought they identified another piece of work that had been done in the same department, identifying which startups have high growth potential. Now, that's a very different sort of situation. For a start, it's about businesses. It's not about people. Um, and but that's the automatic reaction within a department to go somewhere else in the department is something we've really noticed at the Turing in our work across departments and agencies. Um, but actually, it would be much more efficient for it to go across departmental lines. De the, the Department of Work and Pensions are often thinking about how can we identify vulnerable people and those with multiple problems? How can we identify them early? Um, in communities and local government, how can we identify those at risk from domestic violence or homelessness or rough sleeping? And there is lots of other work going on across government as well. But that's not where departments look when it comes to thinking of, um, uh, of, of, of solutions to problems. Why does that matter in the COVID-19 crisis? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example which is based on something we've, we've heard a lot about in the crisis. 
the question of, 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 of people, of vulnerable groups who are suffering worse from various aspects of the crisis and the response to the crisis than others. So, for example, we've got social isolation from the lockdown. We've got children suffering disproportionately from being out of school. Some children, and we're beginning to realise just how many, don't have internet access. So they're suffering digital exclusion, which is now reinforcing social exclusion and reinforcing already existent kind of inequalities in education and educational provision. Um, economic de deprivation, some groups are much more likely to be made um, unemployed, much more likely to be in poverty as a result of the crisis. Um, this could depend on where you live, for example. There are going to be gendered patterns of unemployment. Some people, if, if they lose, um, will, will lose their jobs because they can't go out back to work or they can't leave children who are not at school and so on, or will be unable to go out and look for work. And then, of course, there's the health risk. We know that the elderly have a far, far greater health risk. But now we also know that um, uh, BM, people from BAME groups um, uh, have a, a significantly, a substantially higher risk as well. That seems that the kind of COVID-19 is exacerbating already existent, long-running structural inequalities in healthcare. So you've got all those vulnerabilities and it's quite possible that they can reinforce each other. Um, so for example, there were, I don't know if anybody saw it, but there was an IFS report out on Monday, which showed that some areas of the country are vulnerable to all three of those um, of those risks, social, economic and, and, and health. Um, now, if you know that, and if you have really fine-grained data um, and, and, and models to identify vulnerable groups to a really kind of high degree of resolution, you might be able to sort of identify people and help people um, in, a, in, 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 in a targeted way. You might be able to do something in certain areas of the country um, or offer targeted help for people who are suffering a kind of triple whammy of those three times types of deprivation. But if you don't know that, then people are going to be um, suffering from, from closed doors to really terrifying degrees. Um, I just want to mention something here about data. So obviously you can't have any data science without data. And I think we're realizing all sorts of data we don't have. So take, take the question of the gruesome figure of how many people have died. Um, that is essential part of, of designing any policy response based on um, epidemiological data. You need to be able to calibrate the system based on kind of as near time as possible data about um, the effect that the virus is having. So if you have, sorry, if I did have slides, I'd have a nice um, picture now of a, of, of a, a, a horrified man in a shower. Um, because this is the best analogy that we think of, is that um, if, if, uh, if, if you're in one of those showers, one of those old fashioned showers where it takes ages for it to become hot, they, there's a delay of say two minutes um, before the hot water actually comes through after you turn the button and you're not quite sure which way it goes, then if there is that time delay, then you know you can get completely scalded with hot water um, because you maybe carry on turning the button because you don't think it's working. Um, and any of the kind of interventions that we've had, and of course the lockdown was quite an easy intervention because it, it wasn't easy of course, but it was a kind of blanket intervention. But any interventions going forward are going to have to be much more nuanced and varied. And if you haven't got that basic kind of outcome data about the effect of the virus and the effect of your, crucially, of your intervention, um, then you're not going to manage well. And I think one of the reasons the UK appears to have managed less well than other countries is we just don't have um, good um, data like this. We're discovering that death data, we only really have it kind of accurately three or four weeks after um, the events occurred, which seems odd because whenever a death is registered, it is entered into a um, system. And the other reason why you need kind of more fine-grained kind of data 
is because you you possibly need to make it, you, we need to move away from these sort of very blanket interventions. We know that different sectors are suffering um, to vastly different degrees. Some sectors are doing well out of the crisis, um, and some aren't. But all, most of the interventions so far have been in a very kind of blanket type way. Of course, that's understandable in immediate reaction to the crisis. But how can we have a more kind of uh, uh, a, a, a more kind of subtle response based on, uh, for example, economic data in different sectors um, or uh, data um, relating to geographical areas? We've had a lot of talk about the R number, um, but what does the R number really mean at the national level? What really matters to you is how far you can move around in your local area. You want to have some idea. Of, of, of the kind of risk you're exposed to doing that at the local level as well as maybe the national level. And the other thing is that you need different, uh, you, you need different data sources to kind of come together if you like, because this is my um, sort of uh, main fi fi final main point, um, modelling. Now in a way it's exciting for those of us who are interested in data science um, modelling is suddenly cool, you know, scientists who do modelling and rock stars, I'm sure there's all people, sorts of people signing up for, for, for degrees that used to be um, not, not very, kind of, not considered very exciting. Um, but the focus, if you think about it, in those huge amount of research that's being done at the moment, tends to be very much on the epidemiology or the economy, or possibly um, maybe beginning to be one of one of um, the affected sectors like education. Um, but in general, these are models which don't bring these things together. But they're highly interconnected. We know that um, even within healthcare, for example, we're focusing on the care of COVID-19. But what about all the other indicators of healthcare um, and all the other ways that people are getting sick? Um, or, 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 or dying from other causes and the high degree of interconnectedness with the crisis. Um, we, we're very familiar with that by now. We know it's a thing of real concern, but we don't know very much about it. We don't have the, um, uh, the models or, or the data to really be able to say that much about it. And that's something we need to do. So that means I think that the interventions like schools closing, opening, then not really opening, and so on, are, are really based on the lack of, of, of this kind of evidence, which is so important. And the other thing we've discovered is that some of our models just don't work with surprises. The, uh, the, a lot of people working at the Bank of England and in financial markets are, are battling with the fact that their models don't work with negative oil prices, for example. And if a model doesn't work, it really doesn't work. It's, it's, it, it, it's hopeless. You have to sort of build a new one or, or, or kind of wait. And when you've got something very interconnected and if there's nothing more interconnected than a highly contagious virus, um, there's all sorts of possibilities for sort of cascades of failure, if you like. Um, and we're used to this in kind of engineering systems and things like this, but this is it also coming through to, to human systems. So if your response is, si is siloed, if your edu response to ed in education doesn't take account of either uh, the economy or healthcare, for example, um, if that response doesn't match the interconnected nature of the world, um, then you, you, you can easily be in trouble. And I think that that's the concern at the moment. So I'll just end by making a few recommendations. First of all, don't forget the ethical frameworks here. There's a terrible tendency in a crisis to chuck everything out the window and think, oh, well, we can't think about, you know, we can't think about things like data governance at this point or, 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 or ethical um, considerations. Um, that will always, and we could talk about that, but that will always come back to hurt. Um, we must use data science to do what humans can't. Humans are not good at bringing all sorts of different um, sources of data together. Uh, for example, um, in child welfare systems, um, where, where decision support systems are used that um, 
use uh, data and machine learning to try and predict which children are at risk. That is a very controversial area and you need an ethical framework and in fact we wrote a recent really large report on that where the main thing was kind of if you can't do it in an ethical way you, you, you shouldn't do it. But when you think of the situation before if you talk to experts in this field they will say that the way people made decisions before there were any or when there aren't any of those support systems is quite often looking at different databases in a very fragmented way and trying to put them together kind of in their heads and that's a really super difficult thing to do. Um, data science is good at that if it has the data. Humans aren't so good and we should be using data science where we can to do things like that rather than thinking about designing really super clever robots to do things which after all humans can play go. Um, they may not be able to beat a, a, a robot but in the end you know it is a game and um, uh, humans can do it already. You need integrative models where you bring together um, health, the economy, for example, but other sectors as well. That's the only way you're going to really confront trade-offs. In the British system, um, because of this separation of politics, politicians and um, policy makers, politicians don't very often confront trade-offs and it's not a very politically acceptable one either, this discussion of, of kind of lives versus economic recovery which will also lose lives etc but you know some of those at the policy making system level some of those trade-offs have got to be confronted um, and and um, will, 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 will need to be thought about you need to intervene for vulnerability vulnerability works against resilience um, we know that from mathematical um, from, from you know the history of mathematical um, modeling and network theory and network science and so on um, and then in turn as I was talking about earlier resilience um, threatens vulnerability or creates vulnerability so you've got a vicious circle there. Um, we need to try and quantify uncertainty a lot of the models in machine learning and data science were built for engineering on engineering data where you've got a lot of certainty you've got the kind of laws of engineering if you like and laws of physics and so on um, you don't have that in social in very heterogeneous social systems so we have to think about how much uncertainty there is there and kind of be honest about it if you like we need to try and move away from incredibly complex models there is a tendency to do that to have sort of insane amounts of data as one of my colleagues put it of, a, of, a, of another piece of work um, and try and build sort of simpler models that can answer specific policy questions. And we need, where possible, um, to make kind of targeted interventions instead of um, very blanket, crude um, measures, which just won't be available to us in the post-lockdown period. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you. I went on a bit longer um, than I meant to because it always takes longer on Zoom than you think it's going to. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I'll stop there. And, and uh, if anybody's got any questions, um, I'm very happy to take them. If you want to, you can type your questions into the chat. Um, I see Catherine's put a couple of links in there um, for you to go away and look at. Helen, thank you so much. That was just, um, you make these complex things understandable in a way that, um, <laughs> people like me can even understand which is is just wonderful um do we have any questions there's a question there oh well the international um i mean yeah i think uh i've just come from a, a meeting actually at the foreign office because i sit on the Foreign Office Strategy Directors Expert Group um, and uh, there's a lot of discussion but I, 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 I mean I'm not in any sense an expert in that area and I, I can't comment on the merging of the departments except to say I'm completely against it <laughs> but I mean um, there are a lot of issues uh, for kind of Britain's place in the world here one of them being that you know our policy response to the crisis is going to be a big distinct uh, sort of um, it will distinguish countries 
it already is distinguishing countries. We're already beginning to think a lot about the countries that seem to have managed the crisis well. And it will be very important for Britain's kind of relationship with the rest of the world if we do it badly. Um, and you've had an interesting piece of news today. I don't know if you've seen, probably I'm, I'm the only person that's sort of sad enough to be really, really interested in this. But, you know, you've had a good example today of exactly what you're talking about. So you, you, you know the tracing app that's been, um, the, the application that's being developed to, uh, uh, so that people can notify people that they've met that they don't know automatically that they've got COVID-19 so that those people can self-isolate. There's been a lot of controversy about it, there's been a lot of delay on it, and now finally they've announced that they're not going to do the app that they were going to do, which was um, a very, um, was a centralised one where all the data would be collected centrally. Um, they're going to do, they're going to adopt the same sort of app that they're developing in Germany and France and Spain and so on, which is more decentralised. But somebody was talking about this today and one of the one key point about it is i mean they were talking about it on the news today but i mean one key point about it is that at some point if we want to move from one country to another there are going to be many countries saying well you have to use our app while you're here um because if you turn out to have the disease we only want you here in this country if if you turn out to have the virus then we can notify everyone you've been in touch with. I mean, uh, uh, and that you've just got that exact situation in New Zealand where they let two people in for reasons of compassion because they had a dying relative and um, they turned out to have the virus. They let them out early of quarantine for compassionate reasons and they turn out to have been in contact with 320 people. Um, we wouldn't know that we wouldn't know that they'd been in contact with 320 people at the moment. And we also, whenever uh, New Zealand lift those quarantine restrictions, quite possibly wouldn't be allowed to go to New Zealand in, co in, in contrast to other countries. And if that really happens, you, you know, you can understand why our previous thinking about it was completely um, kind of out of kilter. You've got to have sort of open standards and, and, and um, uh, uh, ways that we can transact with other countries just as we've got to be able to transact within the country so um, it, you know it, interconnection is so in, in important here and it's going to be crucial and another reason why it's going to be crucial as we come out of the crisis something I didn't talk about but I mean is this question of the fact that we're all online we're all online and um, you know a safe secure um, online environment is going to be so crucially important to that as well. Um, if you want to do business, you've got to have a safe online environment. And every sort of online harm that we are kind of used to worrying about is rising. I don't want to say exponentially because I haven't seen any graphs. We probably don't have the data, to be honest. But it is on the rise. Online grooming, radicalization, hate speech, misinformation, really pernicious mis health misinformation. All these things are rising. And if people want to do business with it, with us, particularly in a world where we can't safely go into shops or lots of people can't, then that's going to be important. So totally, um, the international point is, 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 is really important. Um, there's another question here uh how do you account for errors in modeling created by the unpredictable nature of both the virus and human behavior yeah well that's a really good point too because um i mean if you read the notes of sage committees and uh etc you will see a certain and, and you see a lot of scientists sort of talking in the press and everything and you know the behavioral scientists might be saying one thing and the epidemiologists might be saying another but i mean bringing those two sources of data and expertise and modeling together um, is seen far far less and um i uh, both of them have massive amounts of uncertainty in them um and that's the point i made about quantifying uncertainty yes you can't get rid of uncertainty but you can try and quantify what uncertainty you have um, and, 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 and try and kind of build allowances for that into models. And we've got to get better 
for doing that. That is the complete buzzword in the modeling community at the moment, kind of how can we quantify how much uncertainty we have. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very important, but I mean, you know, there's quite a long, because we haven't spent enough time thinking about these things. We haven't spent enough time um, putting these things together. And also, I mean, there are some people arguing that we, and I, I do think this is a, a tendency of the British policymaking system to spend far too much time thinking about one thing and then think about another thing. Um, so in the US, for example, well, the US, it's true in the US as well. So, it, you know, ever since 9-11, you know, two decades of really thinking that terrorism was the worst threat and not thinking about public health. And now I presume we're going to be thinking about public health, but we shouldn't just think about public health. <laughs> you know, we should think about our education systems. You know, we should be thinking about, and I always keep going back to the word resilience. Um, and actually people in the foreign office are talking about resilience. They're talking about resilient trade. And I think these aren't very exciting words. I've said lots of very unexciting words. Well, starting with data science, I suppose, but I mean, you know, resilience, responsibility, ethics. These are not exciting words, but they're going to be crucial going forward. We're actually going to value countries that have got resilience, um, uh, uh, you know, much more than, than, than we used to, um, instead of thinking. And we, I think we should be kind of encouraging that. We should think about responsible innovation rather than just innovation. Um, and, and, and we should be kind of valuing those things um, again. Yeah, and I totally agree with that question as well. So I'm just saying um, there are very few leading politicians with a science or mathematical background. It's terrible. It's, 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 it's terrible. Um, and I think that is another silo, which I, 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 I didn't mention because I wanted to get onto something a bit more positive, but I mean, totally. Um, well, and, and also it's a case of a little ignorance being a dangerous thing because there is enormous enthusiasm, I would say, for the use of AI. Um, uh, several ministers that have, and, and particularly before the crisis, talking rather less about it now, um, but the, before the crisis, huge interest in the use of AI because it sounds so, it sounds kind of cool and there was a lot of impetus to kind of compete with France who, Macron was very good at inventing the concept of Le French Tech or Le France Tech. I can't remember what it was called exactly. I don't know. Um, but anyway, we couldn't say Brit Tech because that's a water filter company. But, um, you, you, you know, we were very much, there were ministers really sort of gearing up to sort of compete with France. And I think we, I hope we will see a more reasoned approach now with these questions of, of responsibility and resilience. People have already started to talk about that with respect to trade. Um, and I hope it's not just words, but kind of something serious. Because, I, I, you know, I think this is very, you know, it's a very, very serious moment because the, the lack of resilience in our healthcare system was exposed by the crisis. You know, we had to go and build the Nightingale Hospital. But we did go and build it, you know, we could do that. But when it comes to education, we're not thinking in that sort of way at all. Um, and it turns out we just don't have enough space to kind of space our children out in schools. In other countries like Denmark, they do. That's why they've got them open. Um, so resilience, I think, goes beyond. It's really important for data science, but it goes beyond that as well. Right. I think I think that's probably the last of our questions. If everyone's happy, um, we haven't got anyone there who still wants to to ask something of Helen while we still have her with us. Um, speak now. Um, otherwise, just to say, Helen, thank you so much. Um, it's brilliant to hear from you. It's just all of this is so important, and it I know for me makes me feel that I'm back at college having these interesting and intellectual conversations about important stuff that's happening in the world and we really wanted in our alumni events to kind of bring that feel of college back um, while we can't be together in person and I think we've achieved that in spades tonight so thank you so much Helen for your well, time. Thank you. Brilliant and, work. Actually, and actually colleges are perfect environments to have this conversation. I mean I mentioned that multidisciplinary thing and the exactly. kind of 
specialization point we really need to be having these conversations across disciplines and that's what politicians aren't doing um well they've got sage now but it's not embedded in the policy making process at all and that's what that is what we need yeah exactly those those conversations that happen at in chapel at college um are going to be world changing i know um so we will short that was the last as i say of our series for alumni um because we're coming to the end of term here at oxford um we've got a couple of treats in store that, that we'll be sending to you via email in lieu of the kind of annual alumni party that we would have been holding next weekend and sadly we can't this year um so we'll be in touch about that but do look out for all of these talks going up online on our youtube channel we'll be sharing that through the alumni e-newsletter very soon um and what else was i to say catherine Oh yes, one more, one more event. We're actually co-hosting an event next week um, with Somerville College, which is going to be fantastic. You're all welcome to join. Um, obviously online, a live online event um, focusing on um, entitled Speaking Out for Refugees. And both Somerville and Mansfield um, are excitingly going to be launching new refugee scholarships from the next academic year. We're both currently busy raising funds um, to support having a refugee scholar at each of our colleges. And we have um, Lord Dubbs, Alf Dubbs, um, speaking for us um, in, I think this week is Refugee Week actually, but, but we're advertising it this week. It's happening on Wednesday next week online. All the details are on our website, um, six o'clock on Wednesday the 24th. And Lord Dubbs is going to be in conversation with Natasha Kaplinsky, the broadcaster. Um, and we'll have the principals of both of those colleges um, involved with that event as well. So that's absolutely one not to be missed next week. We'd love it if you could join us. Um, I'll just, chip in say, just to say goodbye, yes. Helen. Right. Yeah, I was just going to chip in and say thank you because as Helen, other Helen, everyone at Mansfield is called Helen, but yeah. as <laughs> other Helen says, thank you very much um, for being here because it's true that a college is a, is a really good environment for talking about these things and also the community through time as well as in one place I think is really a great thing. You get clever people from a lot of disciplines who are interested in the world and that's how I'll, I hope, try and solve the problems in it. Um, and Helen's a really great example of that. So thank you very much um, for being here, all of you.